<laughs> yep, I'm going. Alright. Slate 15, tech roll 5. Yeah, what was that time when you got clobbered? Tell us about it. No, I didn't get clobbered. Um, I was supposed to be clobbered and I was going to be sandwiched. Neil's playing football with us. Uh, not Neil, a tiny. And two Hibbets came in to collect me. And it wasn't very sociable and I was on the bottom. And they were two both six foot men. And they fell down on top of me. And the next thing I know, Maxie Pike and Bert Webb came in and held them down. They were pretty big blokes? They, they were big fellas, they were six foot. I'm eight, I'm eight and a half stone at that stage, I'm not me other. They were, they came in and held their arms down while they said get up and have a go. It was easy. Both the blokes were held down, I'm going hammering Tom's while they're... <laughs> Tasmanian <laughs> justice, huh? <laughs> yes, it was. It was justice. It was fair, fair enough. enough. Yeah. Fair enough. What sort of player was uh, was Neil when he was, uh, or Tiny as you called him? Tiny? Yeah, he was a good player. He was uh, a very fair player. Not until, a ruffian? Not until he got roughed up. Yeah. Uh -huh. When he got roughed up he might be, but apart from that he was all right. He, you know, until you rough him up and then he bombed. He, he'd bomb after that. You had to rough him up a, bit, a little bit first. And he was all right. He was, <laughs> he was a local identity and I, I hope he still remains a local identity. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Take sixteen. What are you starting? Yeah. Again? Yeah. What what what's what's your first recollections of uh, Neil? Neil, a tiny. When I was a little boy, uh, growing up, came to the district, settled down, went to school here. A competitor. A real competitor. A real competitor. Have a go. Try in uh, I can't think. Yeah, that's okay. And uh, what what sort of did you have a bets with him at all? Oh, every Saturday, uh, Tony and I had six pence every week on a football match. I think that was I think that was Tony's pocket money for the week. Get rich kick quick. Yeah, yes. Well, on feet one, he was all right. He, was, he had twelve. No, he had, a, he had a shilling then in those days, didn't he? He had a shilling. Was he a ruffian on the football field? If need be, yes. Mm -hmm. If need be, yes. Can you tell me again why he got his nickname or what his nickname was? Uh, Australian uh, football was the game, the only game. And uh, and what was what was Neil's name? Tiny. Tiny always. But he grew up. He still maintained the name. Oh yes, he still holds the name. He still holds the same name here. He has to. That's the only name we know him by, Tiny. Half the people wouldn't know his name is Neil. Good. Okay. Take seventeen. Bar. <laughs> It's on automatic. Take 18. Did your brother have much influence on you, Neil? Yes, I, I suppose you could say he did, because he was 10 or 12 years older than I, and he joined the Navy as a very young man during World War II and served in Southeast Asia and the South Pacific. And he would write to me, he knew I was interested, he'd write to, write to me and describe where he had been. So that made me aware of Southeast Asia and uh, and the existence of other countries close to Australia. Uh, in that way, he influenced me. Did you have any recollections of Second World War otherwise? Oh, yes. Um, through his letters, uh, I, of course, became interested. And I remember, very well remember, VJ Day here in Sorel, victory over Japan. 
um, we got a day off school. That was the main thing I remembered. And we rode up and down the streets and in the cars, my father included, tooting their horns. It was a great day here in Surreal. What about your reading? Did you have a particular interest in reading war stories or um, About the same as any other boy of that age, remembering that the war had influenced them. Um, but not particularly so. I had phases of, of reading all sorts of writers, including the Australian writer Ian Eardress, who wrote on Australian subjects, I remember that, but uh, not particularly war stories. OK, cut. Recording. No. Slate 19. Yes, so, can you be looking up at that first, Neil? You know that. Uh, okay. So I decided if I was going to be in this contest, I better get moving. So we were <laughs> marching into school, and I tripped the boy in front. That did it. I got six of the best before he even set foot in the classroom on that new year. Were you ever uh, a brilliant scholar at school? I found it pretty easy. I was, uh, particularly in primary school, when I got to secondary school and I had to work a bit harder, it wasn't so good and I didn't do so well. Um, I didn't like or dislike school. I remember here, right at this school, for Friday afternoon, I'd always deliberately get into trouble on Friday morning so that I'd be put on latrine duty in the, in the afternoon. That was clean the latrines. That was supposed to be the uh, prime punishment. I took it as a good opportunity to get out of school and have a um, four and a half day week. Did your parents have any plans for you? Oh, vaguely, you know, uh, I was going to work in a bank or something like that, or work for the public service, the government, that was even a better idea. You found that quite exciting, obviously. <laughs> well, I, it didn't matter much. Uh, then a good friend of mine was working for the Tasmanian government film. Take 20. Another character I remember was old Adam. He was a tall, gaunt man in his 60s, maybe into his 70s. I never heard him speak. He would walk around the country roads and tracks around here, around the streets, always with his head down, hands behind his back. Uh, we were a little bit afraid of him as kids. But uh, when I was about 16, I guess, I was travelling to the city to work every day always late for the bus, 7.30 bus. And I was running across the churchyard, right adjacent to this churchyard here, one morning, one frosty winter's morning, and I almost tripped over old Adam, who was dead, lying dead flat on his back, close to a, what appeared to be a grave. It was uh, the grave size, was only about a foot deep at that time, and he had maybe had a premonition of his own death, or for whatever reason, anyway, he'd gone out in the dead of night dug the grave and lay down beside it and, and died right there. Have you ever had any...